Thank you so much for joining us for this event. My name is Bree Hogan. I'm the sales manager of Powell's Books at Powell City of Books in Portland, Oregon. Before we begin, I want to encourage you to check out our lineup of upcoming virtual events by visiting our website at powells.com. We're very happy to welcome Jennifer Nansubuga Makumbi in conversation with Tayari Jones about Jennifer's novel, A Girl is a Body of Water. A Girl is a Body of Water is also our indispensable pick, which is our literary fiction subscription book club. You can sign up at powells.com and it is not too late to get a copy of A Girl is a Body of Water as part of that book club. Jennifer is the recipient of the Win Wyndham Campbell Prize for Fiction and her first novel, Kintu, won the Kwani Manuscript Project Prize. Her work, Let's Tell This Story Properly, was the global winner of the 2014 Commonwealth Short Story Prize. She lectures in creative writing at Manchester Metropolitan University. And Jennifer is joined in conversation today by Tiari Jones, author of four novels, most recently An American Marriage, which was awarded the Women's Prize for Fiction, Aspen Words Prize, and an NAACP Image Award. A member of the Fellowship of Southern Writers, Tiari is an Andrew D. White professor at large at Cornell University and the Charles Howard Candler Professor of Creative Writing at Emory University. Today's event will include an audience Q&A. It will start with a conversation between Jennifer and Tiari. If you'd like to ask either of them a question, please submit it using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. If somebody types a question, you can upvote that question, um, which gives it a greater chance of being answered today. And most importantly, please consider supporting both Jennifer and Powell's by purchasing a copy of the book, A Girl is a Body of Water. I will share a link to that in the chat uh, today. We're so honored to welcome both of you today, Jennifer and Tiari, thanks for being with us. Thank you for having us. Thank you, Bree. Well, I want to start off, Jennifer, by congratulating you on this wonderful book. It's called A Girl is a Body of Water. That's what it's called here in the U.S. And in the U.K., it's called The First Woman. And this book is a tremendous achievement. I read it in three days. It's, it's a long book, and I was happy for every page to get lost in this world. Before we start, I have to ask you, how do you feel today? I got my New York Times on my front step and I turned to the book review and basically there is a love letter to you today in the New York Times. How do you feel? Oh, thank you, Tayari, and thank you for hosting me. I, I've been telling everybody, I'm going to be in conversation with Tayari. Remember American Marriage and Cuba Sparrow? So, uh, thank you for uh, uh, accepting to host me, hosting me and Thank you, Powell City of Books, um, for making this possible. And thank you to everyone who has tuned in tonight. About the New York Times review, um, it's very hard to get over it. Because I read it and my jaw dropped. <laughs> I was at a bus stop and I just sat down. I wasn't waiting for the bus, but I sat down and read it. And read it, and then I looked up, and I was like, people are walking past, but they have no idea what I'm going through right, right now. It's such a beautiful and generous and wonderful way to have your book read so wonderfully. It's, uh, it's such a wonderful thing. Well, I just, in case everyone who's listening hasn't seen it yet, I'm just going to give a highlight. It says... Makumbi's prose is irresistible and poignant with remarkable wit, heart, and charm, poetic and nuanced, brilliant and sly, open-hearted and cunning, balancing discordant truth and wise ruminations. I can't believe that's me. <laughs> it is, because it is a really a fantastic book. Um, would you just kind of introduce us. There's some people out there who haven't read it yet. Would you just introduce us to it? Tell us who the characters are, what it's about, set it up for us. Okay, so uh, the novel is about uh, 12 year Chirabo growing up in Uganda um, with her grandparents who absolutely worship her. But her mother is absent. And as she gets to 12, year old, 12 years old, she starts to feel the absence of the mother. 
but at the same time that is happening, uh, she starts to feel this sense of uh, two selves and one of them tends to fly out of her body and she suspects that that's the same self that you know makes her do bad things. So um, it, when she asks the parents, the grandparents, where is my mom? They say, oh, we don't know. But don't think about her. After all, you're, you're beloved. And then when this flying out of the body starts, she imagines that the two are connected and then she works herself into believing that perhaps her mother is not here because she's a witch or because she started flying out of her body when she was young. And what is a girl to do when such things go through your mind, apart from finding the nearest witch and consulting her? So she finds the village witch and um, asks what is going on. And the witch is ready for her. She's like, oh, I'm going to help. I'll find your mother and I will also stop you from flying. But you must visit me constantly for me to be able to do it. The witch, of course, has her own agenda. As witches do. But <laughs> I want to back up. I want to back up. You so casually say, and when she becomes 12, she starts flying out of her body. What do you mean she's flying out of her body? Well, she has two selves. And when she's absolutely distressed, she feels the one of the selves flies out of her body and it's fleeting around the ceiling and around the build, rather around the room. And she can see herself below the her body, below her, because she's flying up there. And she feels like this is how a ghost that has just broken from a dead person feels. <laughs> You know, and so she wonders whether she is possessed or she is a witch, you know, but she feels like she's flying out of her body. So she's flying out of her body. Now, we'll talk about this later, but when I was reading it, I was like, is she flying out of her body or does she think she's flying out of her body? But we'll, we will, I mean, is it, is it that she's flying out of her body? Is this literal or is this mental illness? Like, how do you understand this phenomenon? Um, it's not mental illness, I'll, I'll say that. But Tayari, I am not going to help, I'm not going to direct the reader on how to interpret this. I mean, I can't take the pleasure out of that. I'd rather <laughs> leave people to decide whether it's literal or it's imagined. Fair enough, fair enough. Now, in the UK, this book is called The First Woman, and here in the US, it's called A Girl is a Body of Water. Can you explain these two titles? Oh, uh, well, when I read the book, uh, it was supposed to be The First Woman, because it was in conversation with my first novel called Chintu. Chintu is the first man on earth, uh, as far as Uganda is concerned. Uh, she, he is our academic figure. So, this book was supposed to be the first woman. But when it traveled to the UN, uh, uh, the publisher there felt that the first woman will not be understood in that sense. Because you have a lot of first women. Um, uh, Ginsburg is the first woman to do something, the first woman in, the, uh, in, in, um, in space, the first woman to do this. So, they felt that the, it could be misunderstood and they decided to go for a girl is a body of water and I thought it's a good title. So we went for that. Now, with the title, with the idea of the first woman, that yeah. this second self she has, this rebellious second self who does, as she says, naughty things. Yeah. She's told that that is the remnant of the first woman. Yes. And that this is like the way women were before they were for lack of a better term, I'll say domesticated. Yes. Now, how did you come up with that? <laughs> um, wild imagination. Um, but also from um, folk tales and myth that I grew up with. Uh, that uh, Because that's where, for us, uh, our earliest uh, creativity is you, you know, located in the myth, in the folk tales and in the legends. So I grew up with a lot of that. And uh, the first woman comes from the myth. Okay. So um, 
because she's 12. When she goes to the witch, the witch is actually a, also a rebellious woman. She is a, a kind of traditional uh, indigenous feminist. So when the child tells her that I fly, she immediately recognizes that um, the flying person is the rebellious person. And this is a person who is finding being a woman in the society difficult. And she is so happy because she feels the rainbow has landed, you know, and I am going to prepare her for rebellion. So she tells her that the first woman, uh, the, the person in you who is always flying is the first woman. This is how we were. We were big, we were tall, we were loud. We used to do everything. We were not looked after until we were, that first woman was bred out of us. You know, it reminds me of this famous quote by Toni Morrison. Let me read it to you. Go on. Okay. Toni Morrison says, you know, they straighten out the Mississippi River in places to make room for houses and livable acreage. Occasionally, the river floods these places. Floods is the word they use, but in fact, it's not flooding. It is remembering, remembering where it used to be. All water has a perfect memory and is forever trying to get back to where it was. Writers are like that, like water. I remember where I was before I was straightened out. Wow. Wow. <laughs> It goes perfectly. Oh my days! That can sum up my book. See, I was ah! diaspora <laughs> is real, but I'm not surprised. I mean, it's Tony Morrison. Yes, oh, wow. Paul. Tony Morrison knew our thoughts before we were even thinking. I, I know, I know. <laughs> she anticipated me. <laughs> and you know, but this is also a common kind of theme. If you think about, like, even if you go to something as you know, Four Corners as Jane Eyre, that there is the mad woman who, the, B Bertha, the mad woman in the attic, she destroys the wedding dress because Jane wants to destroy the wedding dress. There's, you know, this, this sense of women having this other self that rejects all the constraints. I oh, think yes. of it as a very feminist novel. And I do believe that feminism, that anytime there's any group of people that is forbidden their freedom. The people want, everybody wants to be free. So anywhere that freedom is not present, there are people struggling for freedom. They don't need, yes. it doesn't necessarily have a name or yes. um, a book about it. But let's talk about the feminism in this book. Do you agree that this is a feminist novel or, or am I overstepping? Oh yes, I agree entirely that it, it is a feminist novel. And I, I, I agree with you that um, wherever people are oppressed, they are trying to uh, undo that oppression. So uh, for me, I believe that conforming is even harder than rebelling because, you know, conforming is the wrong way of being, you know, and this is why when people rebel, most of the time they don't look at it as rebellion. Most of the time they look at it as life. So this is why a lot of women who say they are not feminists, they are feminists every single day of their lives. This is why when people say feminism started at this time, it's so wrong. You know, the very earliest women have been pushing, you know, they have been rebelling, they have been fighting for their rights, but it's just that they've been doing it every day in their daily life. It's not something to write about. It's not something to go home and talk about unless something big has happened. And so when feminism comes and, you know, and it's a movement, perhaps this is where uh, some, some people imagine that, you know, what is going on? That is life, you know? But this is absolutely uh, a feminist novel. And I wanted to talk about the indigenous feminism. Because, you know, um, in Africa, um, uh, feminism, as we know it, arrived in the 70s. But it arrived in such a big way. It arrived 
with language, um, the English language. It was written, it was from Europe, and it had all these conferences and all these white people, white women were talking about big things, and it had theory and theorists, and you had, oh, this is American feminism, this is European feminism, but this is black feminism, this is French feminism. And of course, when it arrived, it just obliterated all the burning ideas of feminism in Africa. Because again, it came with the colonizer is language you know mm. however now we are realizing that that feminism especially in Uganda is not taking root because people turn around and say but it's not our culture it didn't come from us so with this book I thought okay let's go back to our grandmother's feminism uh, you know um it's the word was not feminism the word was when canon canon so let's start there. But we are not going to start where Europe started, you know, with this is what they do to us and this is what we want. The, the traditional indigenous feminism takes you back to the moment the first woman was suppressed. And how did they do it? Why did they do it? And when did women join in? in their own oppression and how come we are perpetuating it you know because understanding all of that then helps us to to find ways of undoing it so it is tayari a feminist novel it is absolutely it's very empowering but it's it's got a loving but critical eye to the culture mm -hmm. is the way that, that I read it. And I think it's a very, um, as we say, intersectional novel. I mean, we're looking at gender and because the novel is set entirely in Uganda, there's not, there's not the um, same kind of racial strife that you have, say, in an American novel. Yes. The, I feel like the, the main site of conflict and inequalities here is class. Yes. And that Absolutely. is, can we talk a little bit about the way that the, the class affects the relationships between the characters? Okay, so uh, in, um, when you take the colonizer in the, out of the picture, you had the aristocratic class, okay? And there were the landowners. And then you had the people who worked on their land, okay? Um, and uh, in the 70s, it's, it's starting to die away, but it's still there, okay? And so you have two little girls. One belongs to the laborer called Jiwa, and Jiwa, the main character, who is the beloved granddaughter of the landlord. And these two are such great friends, you know? They go to each other's home, and often Jiwa, spends weeks in her home, you know, without the, this friction of who is who. But in moments, there are moments when there are conflict between them. And Shirabo is aware. She's aware that her grandfather employs her best friend's uh, father. Uh, and when her best friends, you know, they when they quarrel and her best friend best her, then she pulls out her trump card. And she's like, mm, I can talk to my grandfather about you, to talk, yes. to, your grand, to, talk to your father. So even as, as children, even though they, are, they shouldn't be aware of class, uh, this little girl is aware that she's above her best friend and that she can use it against her. And yes, so, and that she can use her class privilege against her in a way that's meaningful. And her best friend, though, kind of trades barbs with her about questions of beauty and skin color. Well, absolutely, because the friend is beautiful. But this is how women have been cultured to think about themselves, okay? This is currency. Beauty is currency where women are concerned, you know? And this girl, even though she's young, 
She's been told over and over that she's beautiful. And her beauty comes from being light-skinned. And Chirabo is dark-skinned, you know? And so they use these things uh, uh, against themselves, you know? But um, what is important is that when they grow up, the class thing becomes such a big um, um, uh, um, valley between them that is almost unbridgeable. Because you see in Uganda, when women acquire a certain level of um, independence, this comes from being educated, from, be, from owning property, from getting jobs. And when women have that, they always abandon the maternal and the domestic spaces. So as soon as they have their children, they're going to bring in a nanny to look after the children. She's out going to work. And then she has a servant to look after the house. And those women, and this is the major problem in Uganda, those women who are working for these middle-class women, they see them as men. Oh, interesting. Because, yeah, because, you know, what they are behaving like men. They are leaving the, what they should be doing be, as far as these women are concerned, and they're employing them, and then they treat them exactly the way men treat women. And so when a middle-class woman goes to a working-class woman and say, oh, fellow women, let's do feminism, they're like, no. We yeah, are not all equally women. You are men. And outsourcing, I mean, this is a big issue, you know, here, although in Uganda and many other countries, you don't need as much money to have a servant, like you can be a middle class person and have servants, where here yes. in the US, you would need to be, to have a full time nanny, you would need to be making a lot more money. But there is a big thing about, yeah, that that some kinds of women's empowerment is facilitated by the labor of other women who don't well, have access. So like this woman's progress is predicated on this other woman being relegated to this domestic work. Absolutely. And this is what G was saying to her, you know, you are what you are because of what I am. I, I make you, uh, you're being middle class and educated and all the things that you are because of who I am. And therefore, you just cannot talk feminism. You cannot talk about equality. And I, she used the wonderful image of the, the hand. Because in my culture, the, the thumb is male, is a male finger. All of these are female fingers. So um, culturally, we tend to say, OK, the fingers are not the same shape. They don't seem to be equal but they work together. So Chiravo unleashes this image that, you know, my grandmother says that we are not equal, but we should work together. And she says, well, but I'm the tiny uh, little yeah. finger. I am fed up of it, you know. <laughs> their, relationship, their relationship was so moving. And you really, as a reader, you really root for them to get this together. Yes. Because it feels yes, almost like absolutely. a whole the whole fate of the world rests upon these women being able to cross this. And um, no spoilers, so we won't say if they do or not, but I will say that I am, I was deeply moved by the hard work you put in as a writer and, and looking at everyone's point of view. I feel like you're not a judgmental writer, that you, you're an honest, truthful writer and the truth, the truth will out. Um, I'm going to shift gears a little bit. This is a story about telling stories. Yes. Um, I love even how in the very beginning of the book, how she wants to tell her story. She wants to tell stories, but you can only tell a story if you are invited to tell that story. Yes. Can you explain that? Well, uh, traditionally, because um, we tend to tell stories when people are together, but they are talking amongst themselves. So you, you do a call. So you have the once upon a time, we have um, uh, something similar. But until the audience has given you permission, you can't start. So you don't just tell your story. Now, it's until recently that I realized that, okay, that is so similar 
to our publishers and our gatekeepers. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, so I, I guess that kind of storytelling prepared me for publishers to say, no, hang on, you know, you can keep your story to yourself. So tell us the call. So she comes, she come, I'm looking for it in the book. I, under, I um, underlined it. So she comes, she wants to tell the story. All the young people are gathered. They're slightly older than her. And she yes. says, once a day came. And yes. what is it that she wants them to say back? Can you, uh, you wear our eyes? Because that means w when you tell a story, you take people into this story's land. Okay. And you know what? You were the one who was there. Uh -huh. And you are going to take them there. So, and you must be keen, okay? So they must say, keen, you are our eyes. And when you finish, you have to tell them that, you know, as all of that was going on, I ran so fast on these feet to come back and tell you about this woman who did this and who did that because of this. Yeah, it, that is just this idea that, you know, we because we often think about people, you find your voice and you just put your voice out there. You forget that speaking that without, you know, you need a listener and the listener you, you do. and that listening is active. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. You know what? Uh, a, a book does not come alive until a reader works on it. And that I am aware, you know, because we write a book and we think, oh, this is a living thing. But actually, if it's sitting in the library or wherever on the bookshelf, it's not alive. It's until a reader picks it up and starts to bring everything um, to life that, you know, the book starts to, you know, come alive. And this is why when we are writing, we always re remember that a, write, a, a reader is going to create with us. Yes, yes. yes that we're in it together. Like when, people we say, are. like when people say, oh, I don't write for any particular audience. I don't care about an audience. I think it's a little bit, it's disingenuous because the impulse to speak comes from the impulse to be heard. Oh, absolutely. But at the same time for me, um, the way I speak to a certain audience is not the way I'm going to speak to another audience. Oh, tell me more, I, tell me more. Uh, yeah, Look at I, me, I'm all leaning up in the thing. Tell me, tell me. <laughs> you know, Tayari, um, the way I speak to Ugandans, you know, it's not the way I'm going to speak to our publisher, Juliet. You know, <laughs> when I'm with Juliet, I'm sitting straight and I am really, you know, minimal. But when I'm speaking to people in Uganda, I'm all over that place. Oh my God, can you believe it? <laughs> <laughs> and so it is important for me therefore to focus on an audience and because I know I'm more truthful and I hold nothing back when I'm talking to Ugandans I focus on the Ugandan audience on the, yes. so you talk to Ugandans on the page yeah, yeah absolutely I have had the pleasure and privilege of visiting Uganda. I've participated in a women's um, writers collective called FemWrite. Oh, yay. It was amazing. You have been. That's wonderful. Yeah. Yes. And when I was there at FemWrite, I felt that was a very, it was a very feminist thing. It were, there was women from all over Uganda. It was about, what, 20 people who come at once? Yes. And we all lived in a hotel for two weeks and we took right, we did writing classes. I was leading the workshop. We did writing classes all day. Absolutely. And, and I was thinking this is the most feminist thing, nurturing women's voices. I was so honored to, to be a part of it and to participate. Absolutely. Well, I'm glad they invited you, but um, here's the thing, you know, for a long time, uh, you knew about Achebe, you knew about Ngoje, you knew about Wole Shoyinka, and for us in Bucci and Macheta, when I was in, when I was in um, secondary school, the bride price, it killed me. <laughs> it, it, isn't she wonderful? But all of those people, ha very few of them were published by Heinemann. It was always men and men and men. 
So I even in Uganda, there were literally women who wrote, but we didn't study them in school. So this is where FM Right came from. And they were like, no, 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 we are going to create an organization that caters for women, for women's voices. And they started way back in the 90s. And it has produced a lot of women writers. But I suspect it wasn't just Uganda. It was all over Africa. Because if you look around now, most of the voices you're going to hear out of Africa, they tend to be women. But that, that, that is because somewhere in Africa, somebody set up an organization like Femrite, okay? These were mothers, these were grandmothers, and they were like, you can do it. You can be a Wally Shainka, you can be a Nguji, and you can be a Chebe. Actually, you can be better. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Yes, absolutely. I'm going to um, look in our Q&A. Um, I am not great at machines, but I'm going to get this right. Give me one second. Oh, well, here's a very, very um, simple question, which says, and I'm going to um, merge it into something that I want to ask you. The question is simply, what inspires your stories? But I also wanted to merge that with the way that you begin the book with the dedication, and I'm going to read it. Yeah. The dedication is to, oh, I don't have, you know what? It's the print is very small. Do you have your, do you have your copy there? I do have my copy. Or else I'll have to stretch my arms all the way out to read it. This print is very small. Okay. I dedicated this to my grandmothers, La Kelly, Yeko, Abisaj, and Millie on my father's side and on my mother's side. Batanda and Kamida, all of them sisters to my real grandmothers for that thick traditional love, which would not allow me to see that my real grandmothers had passed when my parents were young, not until all of you had passed. Now, uh, <laughs> that, that is true. Um, in you, in, in our culture, your mother is not just, is not your only mother. Her sisters are your mothers and you call them mother. You don't call them aunt. Traditionally, your father and his brothers are your fathers and you call them father. You don't call them uncle, but of course things are changing. And so um, I had no idea that my real grandmothers had died until the last grandmother on the first on the father's side died and I was told the last one didn't have children. So I said, but she has a lot of children. And she said, no, they're how um, uh, are the wives children. Uh, but she was also my, my father's mother. So I had no idea what was going on. And I, you don't ask such stupid questions, you know? And that's when we were told that our grandmother died when they were young. But for my mom, she only told me in 2017. When oh, I was doing, I, yes, when I was doing research for this book. So I had met Janja Batanda, Janja is grandmother, and, and Janja Kamida, and I thought that those were her mothers. But actually, one of them, there were three. One of them was a servant and two of them, yeah. But the servant came when she was very young to look after her because her mother had died, so, but she stayed. And so she called her mother and I called her grandmother. But of course it was all whispered. So she would be like, you know, she's not a servant. <laughs> you know, so it was, um, and then she told me her mother's name and she, did, she told me that her father brought her up until she was 10 before he married because her mother died in childbirth. Mm. So he brought her up until she, she was 10. And I thought, but, but our men don't do that. And she asked me, which men are you talking about? They do. They do bring up their children. Do you see what I mean? So there's that love as a child that you have of your grandmothers from your father's side. And they tended to be many women, like you could have six grandmothers 
you just don't ask, you know? And then you... <laughs> well, all this is really interesting because she longs for her mother, but she has these other mothers. Yeah, she has a lot of mothers around her. And you know, Suta says, oh, they thought they could love the mother out of her, you know? And she inserts herself in that gap. But Chirabo has a lot of mothers and a lot of love around her. But you know what? There's something special about mothers. And she's, she thinks, oh, if these people love me so much, my mother must, would be even better. Oh, yes. And all, speaking of mothers, there's also like a grandmother love triangle in this book. <laughs> Absolutely. It's somewhere it says there, it says she had stolen love from our family once before. Because, oh, uh, yes, the witch. Yeah. Absolutely. So on one hand, you have the love triangle that is going on between Jiwa, Chirabo, and Sio. Yes. But that is the exact mirror of uh, her grandfather and those two women, her grandmother and her best friend. And in both cases, the two women are best friends. And you have no idea what is going on. And this is another thing about relationship between women and how then men insert themselves in this relationship and because the the man is part of the oppressing uh, we don't see the man as a problem we see each other even when we are best friends you they know are, they are competing for the affection of men not just romantically but familially Oh, absolutely, because that's what happens when you are oppressed. You know, you rarely see the oppressor as the problem. You see the other person, one of, uh, if they are part of you, then that is the problem. And it has always been like this. You find a man cheats with a woman and the wife goes for the woman. And you're like, no, that woman didn't know anything about you. She didn't do anything about uh, to you. It's the man who loved you. And, but we always go for the fellow woman. And, 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 and I thought we need to start looking at ourselves as women, as oppressed people, and how we behave. And it's not just women. It's all oppressed people. Because there's this pressure coming from above you, and, uh, you know, it must be expended. You can't ob absorb it. So to let it out, you turn to the people around you or you turn against yourself. It's, it's absolutely, it's absolutely true that, you know, they say you have to um, free your mind first. Like you have to be free enough to love yourself. And this is what this second self is doing. The second self is fighting on her behalf. Yes. For her whole right to be free. Yes. Um, here's, here's another question, because you mentioned that you found out about the situation with your grandmothers when you were doing research for the book. And Stephanie wants to know, how do you go about your historical research, um, not with the big things, but the little things like fashion and, you know, what people talked about, what was, what was funny, how did people shop? How did you get so much nuance and texture into your stories with your research? Well, um, including, that... including your earlier book, Kintu. So with, um, with such the detail, music is the best place. Because wherever you have music, it records what is going on at the moment. And for us, we have a lot of traditional folk songs. And they always told a story. You know, they would talk about a woman. They would talk um, who did this. They would talk a man, about a man or a legend who did that. But also in traditionally, um, sometimes you find it in sayings. So I grew up uh, very close to my grandfather and some, uh, whatever would be happening, he would say, in the past, we used to say this, oh, our grandparents, our great grand used to do this. But of course that has died away. This is what we're doing, okay? So um, I, I, I picked up quite a lot on that, but when I'm doing research, personally, I don't go out and say, okay, I'm going to write a book and I'm going to do this research. I start to write the story, okay? Because I, I must form the story first. 
And so it's until I come to a part that needs researching and I go and research that. Because when I, I noticed when I do a lot of research, you come up with a lot of things you didn't know and you imagine that the world needs to know and you throw everything on the page and sometimes research takes you into places you, you, know, you didn't want to go or just takes your plot into somewhere else. So I, I decided when I was researching Chint, because the, big, the book was growing big and large, so I decided, okay, this is what I need. I'm going to do research on that and then come back and fill it in and then carry on with my story. It, it is true. The research, you can get so much and you want the world to know and it takes every bit of self-control for your characters not to look at the camera and say, did you know? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and throw a statistic at someone. Okay, and here's another question. Um, this is kind of cute. On behalf of Emilio, who's four years old, who is watching today, do you remember your favorite book from when you were a kid? Oh, my favorite book when I was a child. Mm, now that is difficult. I think the first book that comes to mind that I read that I shouldn't have read at that age. Um, <laughs> Tell me. Um, there are two. I can't make up my mind. So one of them is Nguji's The River Between. You know, I was Muthoni, you know, until I died. <laughs> I was so angry. And I felt, you know, because I had grown up on uh, Western classics. So I kept on thinking, Africans don't know how to tell stories. The, hero, the heroine must be alive. And yet he was so heartbreaking and it was so real, but it stayed with me. And the other one was The Lion and the Jewel. You know, the play, Wally Shoyinka's play. Yeah. Oh, yes. <laughs> you were a very mature child. No, you, look, what happened was that, um, so my, my father, uh, in the beginning, my father would come back every day with a book and I would read it. And then when he came back, I would tell him about it. But there were days when he didn't bring a book. So I would go onto his bookshelf and pick out the thinnest volume. And that's how I, I picked up those books. I shouldn't have read those books at eight it was between eight and ten it, it was wrong but for some reason they stayed with me more than the um the other books that i had read from uh from elsewhere it is true that a lot of times children's books are more they people tend to give children books they think children should read as opposed to books that will engage the child yes like i always loved reading from the adult shelf you did? Yes. That, that was, makes me feel I, better. I was like, later for these books about talking animals, I want to read about some people. But yeah, I felt like, so when, it's probably changed now, but when I was a kid, children's books were so lecturing you on right and wrong. And no. not, they didn't have that thrill. And I found that it was even more stifling, actually, ironically, the books that were designed for black children, because they were yes. too, the book was like, they, you have a book and the book, the whole purpose of the book is to say, your hair is fine. And that <laughs> is not a plot. I wanted some adventure, some things to happen. I didn't want to just be affirmed. I think that, I believe that it's my feeling, and I really felt this reading your book, is that narrative is affirming. The narrative does not have to look at you and say, you are just as good as other people. Yeah, Before yeah. You get that message, you get it from the events of the story. Okay. You know, I, you, absolutely. All right. Someone wants to know your process. How do you write? You get up in the morning, and then what happens? Uh -huh. um, unfortunately, I am not like other authors who are um, disciplined. Yes, there are, mom, there are times when I wake up at five and I write until seven in the night. Wow. You know, yes. Press. This is me giving respect. What? Thank you. 
There are times when I wake up and I look at the computer and I get a headache. And I pick up a book to read and I, I, I forget the paragraph above. And that's when I gave myself permission to just sit there and stare in space or watch Netflix. But here's the reason why that is the way I, I write. So, uh, for example, this book, it had been knocking around in my head for four, for perhaps even six years before I put it, yes, before I put it down on the page. So by the time I write, everything, like my head is bulging. I know the characters, I know the place, I know where the book is going. And often I start by writing things in an, with, with a pen. And I tend to, when ideas come to me, they tend to come to me when I'm having a shower. I don't know why. Yeah, it's or sometimes- water, and the girl is a body of water. <laughs> <laughs> but I, sometimes I'm taking a shower and this idea is fantastic. And I say, as soon as I get out of the shower, it's going down. And by the time I finish, it's, I've forgotten. But, yeah. <laughs> but um, because of that, when I start writing, I write compulsively. I write so much until I run out of material. And often when I have uh, the writer's block, I say to myself, okay, the body is saying stop. You know, it needs to repair, to replenish or whatever it does. Just go and do other things. And, you know, so this is why I can write from morning to evening without stopping. And sometimes I get off this computer with my legs swollen. But then I can take three weeks without writing. And you're just filling the well. Yeah. I, so I can't write more than, I can't do more than two hours in a row. Really? That's it. That's the max for me. So do you have a structure? You know, like uh, people wake up at five, write for three hours, then take a dog, dog for walks. <laughs> I don't have a dog, but I get up and when it's, when the writing is not going well, when I'm not inspired, I have all these rituals. Like I clean the desk so before bed, so when I wake up, everything is already in place. I make my coffee. I have this little timer. And she keeps, oh, really? I set her and I say to myself, I say, self, you have to sit here for one B. If, if once the B goes off, you're free to leave, but you have to try because I can't control how much I write. I can only control how much I try. So I say, try for one B. And then if it's still going well, I'll take two Bs, but that's it. But I'm slow and steady. I just inch along, but I don't, I don't get that euphoric binge. But when the, when the writing is going well, I can yeah. write anywhere. I could write, if, if the writing's going well, I could take this pen and write on my arm. <laughs> But when, it's, but when it's not going well, I'm like, where is my tea? I can't write without my tea. Where, where are my lucky socks? That's, that's you know how I know it's going well, because I get weird and picky. But you know, I think that explains one of the things that I noticed about your writing. It is so neat. I mean, you are neat. So I imagine that for someone who works... Not to be. <laughs> <laughs> When I read um, um, uh, um, um, American Marriage, I kept on saying, oh my God, how can it be so perfect? You know, the sentences, uh, honestly, this now I understand. <laughs> this is the Jennifer Show. Okay, next question. Who is your favorite character in this book and why? Oh, look, I tend to love characters and then I fall out with them. Yes, I do. And then in, in Chinto, they would just die. But <laughs> um, I was surprised um, because Chiravo took me by surprise. She changed from what I intended her to be, okay? So I put her aside, but I think I loved Insuta very much. Who, who could not? Well, everyone hasn't read it, so tell them more about her. Insuta is the blind local witch that Chirovo goes to 
to um to help her find her mother and also help her stop um flying but of course as a reader then you find out the chilabo what chilabo doesn't know because this is how the book operates no spoilers no i'm not okay chilabo we see things from chilabo's point of view but we are aware that she's 12 years old and we can see things that she can't see so this right. is why then you discover who Suta is. But she she thinks she's a witch, but why why is it that my dad loves her? Why is it why don't I hate her? Why don't I fear her? You know, that sort of thing. So I think I also discovered her like that. But there was also a little boy. She he is such a uh, uh, sh he is so in the margins. You you don't take much notice of him. He is the boy who, when they climb trees and they find out that Chirabo being a girl shouldn't be climbing tree, he's the one who goes and spits. He's the one who tells Chirabo, who is blissfully in love with her grandfather, that actually her grandfather must have had sex to have her, her dad and Chirabo cannot believe it because sex is so <laughs> disgusting and horrible and her grandfather who is a wonderful person could not take part into the, something like that it's that boy in the beginning he's such so he's so disgusting but when we meet him again when he's grown up he takes me by surprise he is a normal boy and he's in love with Chirabo and he took me by surprise that I liked him in the end. I did. I liked him. I liked him all along. I, I you, you did. <laughs> I, I saw his potential. I saw his. I saw. I saw his potential. Um, okay, let me get another one because we're almost out of time. I want to see if I can find another question that I think we can get. Here's one you can work on while I look through. Who do you recognize as your, um, Marcella wants to know, who do you recognize as your literary parents? Ah, huh. okay. I have a lot and luckily I'm African, so it takes a village <laughs> to bring up a child. Yes. So it took a lot of authors to bring me up. So on one hand you have Titin Dagaremba's A Nervous Condition. Oh, yeah. 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 And there's another lady from Zimbabwe called um, Yvonne Vera. And those should be really my sisters, but yes. And, and there's another woman called Efua Sutherland. She wrote A Marriage of Anansawa. Mm -hmm. um, that's from uh, Ghana. I read her when I was a child, but of course, Chinu Achebe. I mean, I read things fall apart in all forms, in all ways, you know, from the age 10 to teaching. Um, and there's another author called Sembene Usman, is Senegalese, his book, God's Bits of Wood, that was a big influence on my writing. Um, um, then I, we crossed to the US and I did Native Son. I've never read a book that just destroyed me. I know, mm. I know. Mm. Mm. And of course, uh, Toni Morrison. She is the one writer that I pick up and I put down. So when I'm writing and I, I'm working on language, I pick up a, a book. I, my favorite is Sula. So I tend to go back to Sula and her ways. <laughs> I know. I, had, I was going to show you. I have, a, I have a first edition of Sula. You do? Oh, wow. That's... Oh my God, that is Sula. That, that, exactly. that is Sula. It looks so different than you would think, right? I know. That's what she would look like. I guess it's when she was small, not the adult oh. Sula. 
Oh, right. I think that book covers, like over, different types of covers come into fashion at different times. And the book covers look very different from country to country too, the same book. I yes. feel like just as your book has two titles, which is The Girl is a Body of Water here in the US and The First Woman in UK, the book, the presentations of the books really speak to the needs of the different markets. Oh, oh yeah, absolutely. So for the things, uh, the first woman, they went for, um, we, they both have uh, a girl on the cover, but they went for the Ugandan colors, black, yellow, and red. And I was pretty chuffed by that. <laughs> One World is really good at that because with Chintu, they went for the coat of arms of Boganda. You know, the, uh, so um, um, it, that speaks, the, like Ugandans would pick it up and know this is their yeah. book. And there's so many Ugandans in the UK. Oh, no, absolutely. Um, and, and, and this one, you know, I, I, I quite fell in love with the landscape because you have the water, you know, and you have the land. Um, but Chilavo is against that land because, you know, this is a, a war between land and water. So they did a good job of that <laughs> this cover. It's interesting how uh, every com rather country or every publisher for a certain geographic space interprets the book in terms of the cover and the art. But the amazing and the beautiful thing is that they have different covers, different titles, but the work itself speaks to all audiences. And that is the, the glory and the beautiful of the beauty of stories in generally, but this story in particular. Um, we are now at six o'clock, so we have to wrap this up, but I want to finish by thanking you for your time and thanking you for visiting with us. And most importantly, thank you for this beautiful book. And I really urge everyone to order this book right now from an independent bookstore because it is independent bookstores that bring us together with the authors we love. An algorithm can predict what they, what they think you'll like, but they don't know you. It's your local independent bookstore that knows you and knows definitively that this book, you are going to love it as much as I have. So thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, Powells. Thank you. Thank you, Tayari. We have to hang out again. We have to hang out again. Oh, absolutely. You know, you know oh, I, I look forward to seeing you with a, when you come over there or when you come to Uganda or when you come to Britain. Wherever Absolutely. you come and when we, we get together again, I will once again, I will wear my sequin trousers so we can have <laughs> the time. <laughs> you rocked them, didn't you? <laughs> that was really so festive. Okay, sorry, Powells. Okay, sorry, Brie. We're done. I, I really don't want to cut you off. This has been such a great event. I can't thank you both enough. Uh, Jennifer and Terry for joining us today um, and yes please do order this book from your local independent bookstore um, I did post the link to it from Powell's um, into the chat right now so you can go over there real quick and take a look at that the book is a girl is a body of water we're so grateful everyone could join us and on behalf of Powell's books have a great day thank you thank you bye